friends will uh, we'll go ahead and start with the uh, reciting the Namotas and the three refuges. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato Samma Sambuddhas Buddhang Saranangachami Dhammang Saranangachami Sangang Saranangachami Dutiyampi Buddhang Saranangachami Yuti Ampi Dhammang Saranangachami Yuti Ampi Sangang Saranangachami Tati Ampi Buddhang Saranangachami Tati Ampi Dhammang Saranangachami Tati Ampi Sangang Saranangacham. Okay, friends, uh, welcome to this Sunday afternoon uh, talk and uh, uh, meditation practice. So uh, this week, I want to review, I mean, a lot of these things we've heard before, but uh, it's always good to review, uh, and, and especially some uh, aspects about, you know, overcoming the, the hindrances that arise in meditation. Now, we did a whole session on the hindrances, and I posted that book about uh, the conquest of the hindrances and so on. But uh, nevertheless, even though we read it and practice, the hindrances keep coming. Uh, so, and because in meditation practice, especially, the, it's all about the hindrances. Because if there were no hindrances, if all the five hindrances actually subside, you know, that's the... Uh, the, the natural state of our consciousness. You know, there, there would be no need for really meditation practice because the mind would be automatically almost all the time in a state of meditative uh, awareness if uh, none of the, the five hindrances uh, came up. So now in the, the practice that we've uh, you know, gone over before, there's three categories of mental factors or three, uh, uh, you know, groups of, uh, you know, mental qualities that we cultivate that can help deal with the hindrances. And one of them is the five spiritual faculties of faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. And another one of these groups are the jhana factors of applied and sustained thought, uh, rapture, happiness, and one-pointedness. And the third group are the seven factors of enlightenment which are the mindfulness, the investigation of Dhamma, energy, uh, joy, uh, plus uh, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. So some of those uh, three groups have overlapping uh, factors in them. But uh, 
it's how to apply and develop those qualities that help to uh, weaken and eventually overcome or counteract, you know, the hindrances. But <clears throat> before I, uh, you know, kind of touch on that, I want to uh, uh, talk about the spiritual faculties themselves and how they are balanced. So the five spiritual faculties, again, are faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. And they're called faculties because they help get our mind on the right track of the Dhamma, in the right track uh, in meditation. You know, similar to uh, a faculty in the university, faculty members, right? Uh, so a faculty advisor, if you're working on a PhD or, a, or you know, an MA or so, you have a faculty advisor that uh, advises you what to kind of, you know, how to approach a subject. So the same way, <clears throat> the Buddha was our faculty advisor on the path to uh, enlightenment, or liberation, or to the end of suffering. Uh, so, in the five spiritual faculties, uh, concentration and energy are sort of like uh, opposing factors. They, they each do their own important job, but they have to be balanced. And in the same way, faith and wisdom they each do their own job, but they have to be balanced. So in bal balancing the spiritual faculties uh, is what we, we need to achieve that kind of uh, balance. And so faith is, you know, faith has three levels. That initial faith of sort of excited faith, faith. When you first hear something that's new, that uh, you know gives some hope or something, you get kind of excited, right? You know, oh yeah, well, I want to try that. Uh, and so people do a lot of different things, trying to uh, quickly, uh, you know, make progress and, and so on, and. Uh, and it could turn into kind of a blind faith. So uh, that faith has to be balanced with wisdom. Uh, because, uh, and also wisdom has three levels too. Faith has three levels, wisdom has three levels. So three levels of faith are that excited faith. Then the second stage is long enduring faith even though you don't have that initial excitement that you have, that faith kind of just that, you know, kind of keeps you plodding along, even uh, though you're not making as fast a progress as you initially hoped, but still that faith kind of gets you through and helps you to uh, keep on, uh, you know, making it through the, the difficult times. And then finally, there's the unshakable faith, which arises with, the experience of entering the stream when faith is called unshakable faith. And the three types of wisdom I've talked about before are first the intellectual wisdom. So faith and intellectual wisdom, excited faith and intellectual wisdom kind of uh, are paired off. There's, we get that initial faith by reading our first book or hearing a Dhamma talk and you go, wow, wow, yeah, I want to do that. You know, so you get the, uh, that intellectual wisdom gives you the, uh, that excited kind of uh, faith. And then it's the cultivated, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, reflective wisdom. So as you go on meditating and reflecting on the Dhamma, uh, and you know, by reading suttas and by continuing to meditate, 
uh, your, your faith increases when you see how brilliantly the Buddha explained the, the Dhamma and also the little progress that you're making, the little insights that you're getting uh, help to uh, keep that faith uh, alive. So that's how you, uh, it's that uh, the long enduring faith, the continued meditation and uh, study that uh, uh, keeps that faith going, even though the excited, initial excited faith wore off, uh, it keeps you uh, going. And then finally, the Bhavana Maya Panya and unshakable faith, those are, those are paired off. Uh, that it's the experience of entering the stream where you overcome doubt and you have that first glimpse of no self. That is what cements one's faith. It becomes unshakable uh, with that experience of stream entry. And that's why it's called entering the stream. The mind can no longer go back backwards. It can only, it may get stagnated a while and take some time to make more progress, but uh, you know, uh, eventually it, it keeps going towards uh, liberation. So anyway, <clears throat> the, but faith and wisdom have to be balanced. If there's too much faith, and that faith doesn't include the, the further study and meditation, the faith could be blind faith. Uh, and uh, it could get unbalanced. And people might just wind up just praying to the Buddha statue all the time, and thinking the Buddha is going to uh, take them to enlightenment and, and so on, or, uh, uh, you know, maybe too much heavy on the devotion and not enough heavy on in the meditation practice. So normally it, it, it's like that. Uh, and then there's the other side, which has too much wisdom, people that just want to meditate and you know, maybe they don't even take refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, or maybe they do, but uh, still uh, it's mainly intellectual for them, or the, it lacks that the devotion aspect, right? So uh, if you think, oh, I'm just doing it myself, you know, I don't need the Buddha, and I don't need the Dhamma, I'm just going to meditate, and I have all this understanding, yeah, I understand karma and, and rebirth and all these things, and you know, it could be, or you have a lot of sutta knowledge. Maybe you read all the suttas and you can quote suttas and so on, but uh, maybe you also, you could get prideful on, uh, you know, that kind of intellectual knowledge if you, if you don't have it balanced with that faith, like taking refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and, uh, and so on. So anyway, that's how they get, uh, you, you need to balance. And it's mindfulness that does the balancing. See, uh, imagine a, uh, what they call a teeter-totter. You know, the teeter-totter set in the, at the school ground where one person sits on a seat over here, one person sits on a seat here. And in the middle, there's like a fulcrum. And then, you know, they go up and down. The heavier person goes down and then pushes up and the other person comes. <laughs> and so if the two weights are equal, then they can sit and balance. So mindfulness is in the middle. Mindfulness is the, is the balancer uh, by being mindful of when you have too much faith and not enough wisdom or too much dry intellectual wisdom and not enough uh, faith to make it more kind of uh, you know, uh, kind of real, or you could say maybe emotional in a good way. So that's how the mindfulness helps to balance faith and wisdom. Then there's concentration and energy. If there's too much concentration, that means one-pointed concentration where you get uh, absorbed in, a, in an object and the mind becomes very, very calm and you just want to sit there and uh, experience that deep stillness. Then, but don't, you don't want to come out and then do active uh, vipassana type of 
awareness in observing the, the rise and fall and developing insight knowledges and so on. So uh, that concentration can lead to a stagnation. And, and so you need energy to uh, kind of activate that concentration, whereas that concentration becomes concentrated awareness. And from, the, from that calmness, you still have the energy then to investigate like the five aggregates to observe the rise and fall of the five aggregates to see them as impermanent and no self. Uh, <clears throat> so the, uh, you know, the constant, but if you have too much energy, that means if you're always investigating and you're always thinking in your meditation, oh, how does this work? If, and, and trying to figure out everything with your intellect while in meditation, that's also, you're not going to get very concentrated. So you've got to come back and, and calm the mind down. So whenever the mind is too energetic, that's not the time that you should do an investigation uh, and so on, or practice vipassana. If the mind's too energetic, you need to calm it back down. So then to go back and just do some uh, regular, uh, more strict anapanasati or to calm the mind back uh, down. So you help to balance too much energy with concentration. If the mind gets too concentrated, then that's the time to recite some suttas and to you know, bring it back into more uh, active awareness and uh, try to tune back into the, the moment to moment flow of uh, impermanence. If the mind gets you know, stuck in that uh, quietude. And again, it's the mindfulness that's in the middle. And the mindfulness that uh, is, helps us to recognize when we're, we're out of balance with the, the balance of concentration and uh, energy and the uh, faith in, in the wisdom. So it's the mindfulness that uh, you know, helps to uh, balance them. Now, coming back to the, uh, the five uh, hindrances, Now, I know some of you may know, uh, you know, intellectually know the, how to use the overcome the five hindrances. But, uh, it's good just to review it. So with the sense desire, that means, you know, when the mind is getting attracted to sensory stimulation or it's, it's hoping and wanting you can see thoughts connected with desire, whether it's for food or for, for sounds, for, for you know, body sensations or, uh, and so on, uh, you know, entertaining fantasies. Uh, you know, that's not the time to uh, practice uh, investigation, uh, but that's the time to uh, you know, practice one pointedness or more concentration to calm the mind down. And also the mindfulness of the spiritual faculties uh, helps to overcome that. And mindfulness of uh, in the third and the fourth jhana also by attaining the third and fourth jhana, you calm the minds, uh, you overcome temporarily suppressed the uh, sensual desire. But uh, normally it's when our mind is too active and we, we see that desire arising. Then we, we can examine, of course, to see the danger in the, in the sensual pleasure, especially in the, if you keep pursuing it. And to see the satisfaction, contemplate the satisfaction, the danger and the, the escape from the sensual pleasure. And the escape from sensual pleasure is basically either attaining the 
the third and fourth jhana, where you have equanimity, or, or even any of the jhanas, actually. Uh, or attaining the uh, you know, third stage of in, enlightenment, uh, reaching the anagami, where sensual desire is totally overcome. But uh, it's mainly that reflection on seeing the danger of the sensual desires uh, and then practicing uh, one pointed concentration, which is just more of just a strict anapanasati, maybe focusing at the tip of the nose and trying to you know, gain some nimitta that really uh, calms the mind down and stops the, you know, the thinking process. But without getting too much stuck in that, once the mind calms down, then you know, come back and start contemplating again. And the ill will, the, uh, to overcome ill will, it says to, you know, try to practice the jhana until you attain the, the piti and the sukha. So if you attain the first jhana, then you get filled with this rapture and happiness so that any ill will thoughts in your mind uh, would have uh, dissipated. But it may be difficult to... Uh, to attain the jhana if, you, if your mind uh, is entertaining ill will. Uh, and then also the faith of, of the spiritual faculties, developing the, the faith in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and also reflecting on the danger of ill will and the consequences of entertaining ill will. Uh, and these are the things that we have to apply, you know, while we are meditating, but also even out in the daily life too. And then the, the restlessness, agitation and restlessness called udacha kukucha. So, you know, this means like worrying about things that you didn't do that you should have done or worrying about things that you did, uh, you, uh, did and you shouldn't have done, or you didn't do and you should have done, uh, or just other types of obsessive worrying uh, and so on, thinking about the past and the future. So again, the, the rapture and happiness of the jhana, attaining the jhana as a way to uh, subdue that restlessness and also gaining tranquility. Uh, tranquility and equanimity of the enlightenment factors also calms down uh, that restlessness. So the concentration of the spiritual faculties and the tranquility and equanimity are ways of uh, overcoming restlessness. And when you're restless also is not the time to practice the investigation of Dhamma or not, not the time to develop energy and the rapture also. Uh, because that's when you need the, the more calming things like the tranquility and equanimity. And then doubt. So the, the spiritual faculties of faith and wisdom are what we uh, need to overcome doubt, or as I mentioned before. Uh, wisdom is the antidote for doubt. Doubt means your, your Dhamma knowledge is not uh, you know, uh, strong enough yet to overcome uh, the doubts. So developing wisdom, practicing vipassana meditation, and reading suttas, and gaining that type of intellectual reflective wisdom, and, and the bhavana maya panya, and also the investigation of the enlightenment factor of investigation helps to overcome uh, in those uh, doubts. So that's how we have to try and uh, use these 
you know, all these categories of mental factors and so on. The Buddha just didn't give them out of just, uh, just for the sake of giving you lists of things to memorize, but these are actually uh, active practices. Because Mara is very entrenched, you know, Mara is the delusions in our mind. Mara is the, is the accumulated habits uh, within our mind and, and the attachment to them, and especially the attachment to the ego and the self, which are all exhibited in these uh, five hindrances. So it needs a very strong medicine. You know, uh, ignorance uh, and, and those hindrances, you know, they go very, very uh, deep. And the, the fetters, the 10 fetters are like the roots that go deep into the ground and the hindrances are what just come up, you know, like the leaves and the fruits uh, come up, uh, you know, each season uh, when there's the, the right sunshine and rain. And, but because the roots are there, and so those roots go very deep. And that's uh, basically what we call the Mara, or those habits that keep on exerting themselves and are, uh, you know, we're believing in them and uh, thinking that's going to bring us uh, the happiness. So uh, all these the spiritual faculties, the factors of enlightenment, and the jhana factors, these are all the, the medicine the medicine that the Buddha taught about how to uh, uh, weaken these powerful uh, fetters and hindrances that uh, keep our life kind of just going around in, in low level uh, circles. So anyway, I just wanted to uh, remind you of that because really that's probably 80 or 90 percent of your active meditation practice is going to involve, uh, you know, cultivating these uh, qualities and uh, using them to overcome the hindrances so that you can, uh, you know, make uh, some gradual and steady uh, progress and therefore increase one's. Uh, faith and one's uh, enthusiasm for the Dhamma and, and uh, inward uh, uh, tranquility and stability. Okay, so uh, having said that much, uh, I'd like to see if any of you have any questions based on that. I don't see any so far here, but if anybody wants to write uh, down a, a question, uh, feel free to do that. Otherwise, if not, uh, we can have a, a longer uh, yoga session uh, and then meditate after this. In this question, the five faculties are very similar to the seven factors of enlightenment. Are there any differences? Well, in all those lists, there are overlapping qualities, like concentration is uh, listed in uh, most of those. Concentration is a, a, a spiritual faculty. It's also a factor of uh, enlightenment. And uh, it's also the, the jhana uh, absorption factor. So there are some similarities, but uh, there are differences. So sort of, like faith is not mentioned in the, uh, the enlightenment factors or the jhana factors, but it is a spiritual faculty. Wisdom is also mentioned, uh, uh, well, it's not directly mentioned in the enlightenment factors or the jhana factors, but it is one of the uh, spiritual faculties. So, you know, some of them overlap, but 
they're all, they're all kind of connected. Wisdom, wisdom and faith are kind of connected. It's the, it's the wisdom that actually gives you the faith and the faith that wants you to develop more wisdom. So they're, they're connected, you know, they may not be uh, exactly similar, but they're, they're connected. And so, uh, and you have to understand also the three levels of each one of those levels of, of wisdom to the uh, wisdom of reflection and then the, the, the wisdom that comes out of deep meditation. Uh, this question, would you please explain the following sentence? Such is form, such is origin, such is passing away, such is feeling, such is perception, volitional formation, such is consciousness. It's origin, passing away. Can you refer me to some suttas that explain this concept? Uh, well, almost any sutra that talks about the five aggregates is probably going to, I can't quote, you know, exactly which suttas because there's many, many suttas, but especially in the Sanyutta Nikaya, but any sutra that uh, talks a little bit extensively about the five aggregates uh, is, you know, that's, that's the standard uh, passage that the Buddha explains. Uh, this is form, this is the origin of form, the, uh, the cessation of form, the path leading to the cessation of form, this is feeling there, that as you just mentioned. Uh, uh, and so the arising of these things is because we are born. So <laughs> that's the arising. Uh, they arise because we are born, uh, form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. Uh, how do they uh, remain and increase by our attachment to them? How do they decrease? How do they cease by developing wisdom and by developing non-attachment and eventually by terminating the rounds of rebirth is the way that they're going to cease, uh, actually. <laughs> and then the, the path leading to that uh, way is the way that you, is the Eightfold Path. So, uh, you know, that standard phrase is mentioned hundreds of times. Uh, and I just can't give you at, at the moment one exact sutta, but we've gone through so many of the suttas we've gone through. Uh, you know, that's a good, uh, you know, that's the way you learn the suttas, you know. If, if, you, if I just give you an exact quote, it's too easy for you, you know. Go to the section that has these things like the five aggregates and read a few and you'll discover some gemstones there, you know? So uh, to give, give you some of the work of go investigate, that's part of investigation of Dhamma. Where is this found, you know? Because as you read it yourself and as you learn the ways to navigate the suttas, you'll be able to very quickly find stuff in the suttas that, you know, you can't memorize everything in the suttas. It's too much, uh, but uh, by uh, you know reading the suttas enough and, and uh, you know uh, doing the research, you 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 find uh, you become familiar with that, and it becomes easy to find to find stuff up, and it's, it has more meaning if you find it up on your own, just as uh, for somebody to tell you uh, about it. But yeah, look in the Sanyutta Nikaya, especially in the Kanda Bhaga. There's a lot of them there. And also in the Majjhima Nikaya, there's uh, something. The five aggregates. Uh, restlessness. Can we also look at it as having an underlying cause and investigate it. Yes, all these uh, hindrances, you try to, de to see what is the underlying cause. And you, know, you can see restlessness. Let's say uh, 
you know, you're sitting in meditation and then you just get, you know, maybe, maybe you heard there's a good program on TV tonight and you, you want to watch that. And to, so now maybe, you know, you're meditating and, you know, you're wondering, oh, is it time for that program yet? And, you know, this is going to disturb your meditation. This is going to cause restlessness to arise. Or uh, pain. Maybe you're expecting some pain to come back. Maybe you had a pain and it went away for 10 minutes. And, and so these underlying tendencies, it, it all comes back to the underlying tendency of greed. That means attachment, wanting something. And the possibility of not getting it will cause the restlessness. And the underlying attachment to ill will, the expectation that some kind of pain or uh, unpleasantness is going to come to you that also will agitate you know from the unconscious mind it may not be conscious yet but the unconscious mind also works by itself without you even knowing it and that's why it's called an underlying tendency uh, and then the delusion of course the ego it all comes back to that because everything is related back to the sense of i me and i and anything that threatens that is going to cause restlessness. That's the thing. That's why restlessness is one of, doesn't go away until arhatship. And it's connected with subtle mana. If you're familiar with the, the five higher fetters, that the anagami still, has, you know, the never returner still has five subtle higher fetters. And one of them is restlessness. And one is mana, which means the conceit, I conceit. They're connected. Uh, and that's the way we have to try to see, you know, the Dhamma. We have to see how all these different things are, are connected. And then you, you know, you get a, a much better understanding of the Dhamma and also appreciation of how wise the Buddha was. I mean, you know, who can think of all that? Only somebody like the Buddha or an Arahant you know, could actually teach it and then explain it so well. Mm. Can you give some practical advice on how to reduce and stop clinging to day and day pleasures in our lives, like meals with family, photographs of family, music, uh, um, well, you know, if you have to interact with others, then of course you have to also find a balance, you know. You have family members and then, you know, they like to do all these things, uh, you know, talk during the meals and, you know, get together and look at old family albums. I mean, you know, that's what families do, right? And so the, the more you, if you live in a family, you, you have to, uh, you know, you find a balance, you know, and go ahead and, you know, uh, you know, you can kind of participate a little bit in that, but you don't have to feed it on by saying, oh, is that, who is that one? You know, you get too interested. So, you know, you can kind of go along with what's happening. Uh, and, uh, you know, watch any aversion that may be in the back of your mind that, and so on, but uh, you know, you've chose to live the household life, so that's that's part of it, right? And uh, so, I mean, I had to go through this because you know, as, even as a monk, I went and I visited my family uh, at times, uh, even at, when they came over and were doing all that. But you know, I, I didn't get caught up in all that. They, they, of course, they expect I probably not going to do that. <laughs> uh, but you know, I sit back and listen and say, okay. You know, you just keep quiet and, you know, maybe make some comments sometime and they say, what is your opinion on that? I'll say, well, you know, whatever. I just, uh, whatever happened, whatever happened to come up. So anyway, that's the... Uh, I mean, sure, we get pleasure out of doing those things, but you know that also is a, becomes a source of restlessness because then you, you, you know you may start thinking about these time things at other times too. Uh, 
Can you discuss how the nine attributes of the Buddha and their recollection can help us in our daily practice? We're too complex. Reserve a future Dhamma talk on them. Uh, I suppose you're probably uh, referring to the Buddha Vandana, where it's such indeed is the Buddha, you know, uh, the blessed one, the fully enlightened one, the Arahant, the teacher of gods and humans, uh, teacher, of, trainer of persons to be tamed, uh, enlightened, and exalted. I guess those are the, the nine attributes you're talking about. Uh, yeah, that, that might take a, a longer time to contemplate, but they all re refer to, uh, uh, you know, the qualities. Such as need is the the Buddha worthy, so he worthy of respect because he's trans, trans, you know, transcended, you know, the ordinary mundane, uh, uh, you know, attributes and so on to achieve the highest, of, you know, perfection. But anyway, I don't want to get them all now. You can you can read commentaries, you know, about them, in the same way as as with the Dhamma, the qualities of the Dhamma. And the Sangha, too. Uh, so, yeah, maybe I could uh, reserve a, <laughs> a future uh, uh, talk on them. There was a question. The question on breathing can be considered as desire. Because there's a question that is breathing a desire? Well, it's a desire to live, you see, there's the desire to live. And it goes way down the deepest desire that's, it goes down to the ego. And, and uh, you're not always thinking I'm gonna breathe now, no. But uh, when you get very deep into meditation and you're observing, especially when you hold out the breath, you can see there's a desire to breathe in because of the desire to live. You can see it very clearly. Because that's the only reason why you would want to breathe in again, because of the fear of dying uh, and that you want to live. And it's the ego that's the underlying uh, source of that. That's why when the Buddha overcome the ego, when an Arahant overcomes the ego, they have no more desire to live, but they're not going to kill themselves either. And they, they let their karma work itself out. And they go on breathing because in one, on one level, it is an automatic uh, process. They're mindful of it, but uh, they're not going to willfully stop their breath and kill their, their body because uh, to them, that would be considered uh, maybe transgressing a precept, perhaps. They might think that. Or somebody might consider that, you know, if somebody, if an arhat commits suicide, they say, well, an arhat wouldn't uh, commit suicide. Anyway, there's some controversies and debates <laughs> around that that uh, I don't really want to get into. Um, so, but yes, uh, but, uh, you know, you know, don't worry about it. You know, worry about other desires. Let, leave the breathing to the end, you know. <laughs> like, you know, let's say hatred. You deal with hatred first, you know. Uh, or other types of emotions, you know. Leave the, the desire of breathing, you know, down to the to the last one. Okay. Uh, playing chess online is consuming much of my spare time. Instead of using it for deepening dhamma, chess doesn't seem to fall into any of the five hindrances. Which hindrances are belonged to? <laughs> And what antidote to use for curtailing it? Well, the reason why people play chess or other games, because it's something to do. And it's, maybe it's a challenge. You know, it's a com competition, right? You're, you're playing against somebody else normally. And the desire to, to beat them, right? To, to show off your intelligence. So there is some kind of ego there that wants to do that or out of boredom, uh, you, 
this is something to do, right? So either it's out of uh, boredom or restlessness or, of course, those are tied to the ego too. So, you know, you have to examine your motivation when, when doing these various hobbies and pastimes. Now, that may, may not be any big deal in playing chess from time to time uh, or uh, any doing something else, but if it consumes up too much of your time, as you mentioned, and taking it away from meditation, then you can consider it to be uh, a hindrance uh, of just that, you know, some sort of desire, uh, you know, especially if it's a desire to want to show off how skillful you are in playing chess or a chess tournament, you know, and be known as a champion of Rhode Island or whatever. Uh, you know, there, there's, the, the ego gets its, you know, satisfaction in lots of uh, different ways. But doing things, again, with moderation uh, may be no harm, but once it's, it, you know that it's, it's either chess or meditation, take meditation. Uh, because ultimately that's the, that's the ultimate chess game, checkmate. Checkmate your ego, right? right? Checkmate the ego, checkmate, you attain enlightenment, you attain, you know, checkmate ignorance, you know, you attain the stream. You got around Mara, that's right, checkmate Mara, play chess against Mara. Move your pawns and your rooks and all these other things around, maneuver, outdo Mara. So you could say Dhamma meditation is a chess game, but we're competing against Mara. Mara sending out all of his rooks and uh, his, you know, all these different names of these uh, figures, right? In chess, I can't remember them all. But, uh, you know, and they're trying to checkmate you into more attachments and more ego. So you got to play the chess game. So Dhamma, uh, the Buddha was a chess player. I mean, you, you're playing against your own mind. So you got to send out your pawns and your rooks and your kings and your queens in terms of Dhamma practice, seven factors of enlightenment, the jhana factors, the spiritual uh, faculties. These are your chess players. These are your, you know, chess things that you're, you're, uh, you're knowing the movements and you know how to trap the other guy, you know, trap the hindrances, trap the fetters. Okay, try to see it in that way. Now, if you apply the chess to the Dhamma, then I would say play that chess game. Uh, let me see here. Uh, okay, it seems, uh, looks like uh, we're out of uh, questions there. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, those are, uh, some good questions. Yeah. Uh, so, if there's no other questions, uh, let's take a short break, and then maybe if there's any last question, or uh, when we come back from a short break, I might be able to answer one more question before we uh, do some yoga exercise. And I may uh, I may uh, uh, take a minute or two to put the camera back to what I showed you and. Uh, do some yoga exercises with the other view so you can see me doing the positions easier than when I stand behind my chair where you cannot see my my uh, like lower body and so on. Okay, so we'll take a few minutes, uh, come back. It's within the lung, there's lower lobes, middle lobes and upper lobes and uh, you know they can be breathed into even separately if if you want uh, but uh, normally people just by because of gravity the air and because of the diaphragm is the main muscle used the air comes down in here first and then moves upward but most people don't breathe in enough and they don't get air into the upper part of the lungs but it's important to get air into the upper part of the lungs because that's what helps to send blood and prana energy up into the 
the brain and head uh, to help the, to be more awake. So I just wanted to uh, go over that with you for those who may not be familiar with it, because really it's one of the most valuable and useful things to use even during meditation to help overcome sloth and torpor for one thing, and also to help stay grounded and centered uh, in the body that I, you know, uh, which is my main uh, focus of the meditation practice. So anyway, uh, I'm not going to go into detail, too much detail right now, because we don't have enough time. Uh, <clears throat> but for right now, we're going to try to count to three. See if you can follow my, uh, by putting the hands here, you have to divide the breath into three equal parts. Not three different breaths, but in one breath, first third of the breathing in the bottom, second third of the breathing into the middle, and the last part of the air drawing it up. You feel that expansion all the way up to the base of the neck. You feel the, the pointed end of the low, lung lobes as they inflate, they move up, you know, just underneath the collarbone. So I'm going to kind of talk you through that, see if you can follow this uh, uh, speed, or I'm going to demonstrate it one time. So the breath starts in the lower part finishes up here and the out breath also ideally starts in the, you let the breath out first from the lower lobes and the middle lobes and then the upper lobes. Although if that's difficult, just you can let them out all together. So I'm just gonna demonstrate it one time and then try to join <clears throat> with that. So I'm gonna start breathing in. And holding the breath for two seconds. So move the hands down for the start of the out breath and the out breath. You might even hear that sound that I'm doing. Out breath, one, two, three, in breath, one, two, three, out breath, one, two, three, in breath, one, two, three, hold the breath, out breath, one, two, three, in breath, one, two, three, hold. Out breath, one, two, three. Continue that a couple of times by yourself. And then relax, just feel the whole body standing. See if you can feel some subtle effects from doing that breathing in your body and mind. The mind might be a little bit more calm. <clears throat> so we coordinate that type of breathing ideally with the movements. Some of the movements 
uh, can be done in that same breathing, such as this next one. So you can go ahead and you know, just watch and follow me. We've done these before. So on the in-breath, raise the arms over the head, interlock the fingers. That draws the air from the lower to the upper lobes. And stretch the arms up and arch back. It keeps the air in the lungs. On the out breath, turn the hands down and touch the top of the head, feeling the air go out of the lungs. And again, in breath, raise the arms up. Out breath, touch the head. Once more in. Release the fingers and the out breath, arms back to the sides. And relax. Feel the feet pressing the floor. <clears throat> the next exercise, we're going to do knee bending. So if you have painful knees, or trouble in the knees, you might find it a little difficult or to balance on the toes. But on the in-breath, lift up on the toes and raise the arms up parallel to the floor in front. On the out-breath, bend the knees and lower down, balancing on the balls of the feet. Come down as far as you comfortably can. And a deep in-breath, push up. all the way up on the toes, out breath down. In. Out. In. The out breath, relax. Just feel the increased heart beating. Just remember standing. Standing, standing. <clears throat> now spread the feet apart, the wider the better. We're gonna do twisting from side to side holding the arms out, breathe in. And look at the right hand on the out breath, twist around to the right as far as you can. Keep your eyes focused on the hand going backwards. On the in breath, come back to the front and let the feet turn with the body. And the next out breath, the other side, In breath, back to the front. And again to the right, out breath. In breath, front. And to the left, 
out breath. In breath. And once more to each side. In breath, front, out breath. In, out breath, relax. <clears throat> Just feel each foot pressing the floor. Feel the hands touching the legs. Just feel the sensations in the body, the increased heartbeat or pulsation. Feel the clothing touching the skin. Now we'll do the forward and backward bending, keeping the legs apart. Again, be careful with the back bend. Coming up from a back bend, it could be a rush of energy to make the body shake or feel like you're gonna black out. You don't want that to happen. You don't bend back too far the first time. So breathe in. Hold the breath a second. And on the out breath, bend forward. Let the hands slide down to the knees the first time. You keep the head up, looking out straight ahead, the legs straight. Try to flatten the spine, make it like a tabletop. And the in breath, lift up and move the hands around the back under the buttocks for support. Let the head go back, the out breath, bend backwards, keep the eyes open, look up at the ceiling. Carefully lift up on the in breath, be aware of any shaking. And again, the out breath, second time, let the hands come down below the knees, still keep the head up, legs straight. Flatten the spine, get the hump out of the spine. The in breath, lift back up. And again, hands around under the buttocks. Back bend, the out breath. In breath, lift up. And the third time, out breath. Let the hands come down as far as you can toward the feet. Still keep the head up as much as possible. Legs straight, feel that stretch in the hamstring muscles, the back of the legs. Hold it a little longer. And the in breath, lift back up. And once more, the back bend, out breath. In breath, lift up. 
On the out breath, just relax, feel the whole body. Might feel the subtle inner shaking. Being that life force energy moving through the whole body mind system because of the movement and breathing. Feel each foot pressing the floor. Just remember standing, standing, standing. We now bring the feet back together. It was just one last exercise, the head turning from right to left. On the in breath, turn the head to the right. Try to look over your right shoulder, turn your eyes to the right, and look further back. On the out breath, all the way back to the left. Concentrate into the neck vertebrae, feeling them loosening up. Turn your eyes to the left to see something behind you. Again to the right, in breath. Out breath, left. Once more, in breath to the right. Out breath, left. And in breath, let the head stop in the center. You can just feel the whole body. Try to feel the outline of the whole standing body, feet pressing the floor, hands at the sides, the head on top. Standing, standing. It's the natural body centered awareness. Okay, friends, so we'll uh, get ready for the, the sitting meditation.
I hope after that uh, yoga exercise, people could have a better sense of being centered, grounded in the body, and feeling some subtle sensations, because we use that as a foundation for the meditation. <clears throat> so let's try to sit straight, be comfortable with the chair. Keep the chin level with the floor. Once you place your hands, either one on top of the other, on, on the lap or against the abdomen, or resting on the legs. Just gently close the eyes and just feel the body sitting on the chair or floor. Just focus your attention down where the buttocks press the seat. You just feel that point of contact. Try to feel your left buttock and the right buttock. Just know that you're sitting. Just remind yourself sitting, sitting. Now let the mind kind of move down the legs. Feel your upper legs, then the knees, and down the lower leg to the feet. And just feel where the feet press the floor. Feel the sensations in your feet, your heels, your toes. Start to feel some life force sensation, subtle pulsation. If you're wearing socks, to feel the clothing rubbing against the skin. The ability to feel these things sharpens your awareness. And let the awareness kind of move up to feel your hands and fingers. Try to feel the outline of different fingers or your thumbs. Try to feel the subtle life force vibrations in the hands. And let the awareness kind of rise up through your arms. Feel the lower arm. And then the elbows. And feeling the upper arms. Feel the weight of the upper arms hanging from the shoulders. Feel where the clothing touches the skin of the arms. And relax the shoulders. Feel the clothing touching the skin of the shoulders. And take a couple of deep breaths to feel your chest, the expansion of the chest. And do the middle lobe breathing. Feel that expansion of the chest. Hold the air in a second to let the breath out. Just feel those sensations. 
different sensations of the clothing touching the skin on different places. This exercise helps to develop both concentration and alert awareness, ability to notice different subtle sensations in one body part. Let the awareness move up to feel your mouth and feel the tongue and the gums and the teeth inside the mouth. Just feel the raw sensation. And feel the lips touching together. Feel the upper lip touching the lower lip. And again, take a few more deep, slow breaths. Try to take the, a three-part breath as we did in the yoga session. Start in the air in the lower lung, drawing it up through the middle to the top. Try to feel the air as it moves through the nostrils and hold the air in a few seconds. You might even hear the sound of the air. And on the out breath, you feel the sensations of the contracting out breathing. Take a few breaths like that. And on the next out breath, just discontinue the deep breathing. Just feel the present moment awareness. And feel your face. Feel the outer nose. Feel the eyes resting in the sockets and the eyelids stretched over the eyeballs. Just relax the eyes. You might see some color or light behind the eyes, or just darkness. It's the present moment awareness. From that point behind the eyes, feel other sensations on your head or face.
and let the awareness kind of expand back out to feel the outline of the sitting body. Just get the general sense of the feet pressing the floor underneath, the buttocks pressing the seat. The hands touching together, the shoulders, the head on top. Not in, not in details, just that general sense of the sitting body. And try to keep that outline of the sitting body in the mind's eye. Just remember sitting, 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 just this body here and now. And again, take some more three part breath. Starting the breath in the abdomen by gently pushing out the stomach and expanding the middle rib cage and the upper chest. Feel that air coming up to the base of the neck and hold the air in the lungs for two or three or four seconds to feel or imagine the oxygen getting into the bloodstream and then feel the relaxing contraction of the out breath. Just take a few more deep, slow breaths like that, cultivating this present moment of mindfulness. And breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Again, we're going to try counting the breaths from one to ten to gain a better concentration. Keep the attention focused on breathing in the three parts if you can. And on the next expanding in breath, mentally count to one. Hold the breath a couple of seconds, feeling the pause. With the contracting out breath, also count to one. One complete round of breathing. The next expanding in breath, count two. Hold the breath a couple of seconds. In the out breath, two. In breath, three. Out breath three. In breath four.
out breath form. In breath fine out breath fine in breath six Out breath six. In breath seven. Out breath. Seven in breath eight out breath eight. In breath nine, out breath nine, in breath ten. Out breath ten. Now discontinue the counting, discontinue the deep, slow breathing. Just let the breathing return to its own uncontrolled rhythm. But continue to feel it. Stay focused there in the center of the body, to feel the subtler, shorter movements of the breathing but still pay attention to the, the in breath and the pause the out breath and the pause just make that your primary focus of concentrated awareness and remembering. You can use these brief mental notes to remember. Just in, in, sitting. Out, out, sitting. Or just sit, breathing in, sit, Breathing out, sitting. Just feel the different little sensations connected with the breathing. Noticing how each breath is different. Sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. Sometimes you feel the sensations in the abdomen. Other times you feel it more in the rib cage, your chest. It's always changing. 
to be like a scientist sitting in the laboratory. His body is the laboratory. Looking down to the microscope, which is our consciousness. To observe subtle movements of the breathing. Tuning in to the present moment awareness. Breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. This is your applied and sustained attention. You have to apply your attention and then sustain it. To reach concentration. Try to notice the brief pauses between the breaths. If you can notice the brief pauses, that's a deep level of awareness. Feel that vibration of the present moment in those pauses. Observing the breathing, so be alert for any hindrances arising, drowsiness, or thoughts of desire, or ill will, or restlessness. So be able to identify them. Oh, this is sense desire, this is ill will, this is restlessness. This is drowsiness. Just by noticing them, they might go away. If they keep coming back, we can apply the antidote. To overcome them. We always keep coming back to the present moment of breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting.
With each out breath, try to feel the body and mind relaxing, centering more and more into the present moment. Stay awake, alert. If the hindrances are strong, then play your chess game against Mara. Play your hand of the spiritual faculties, the jhana factors, or the seven factors of enlightenment. Keep refocusing the attention to the breathing from time to time. Take some more three-part breaths to help stay grounded, centered in the present moment. It's one of the best ways to stay centered in the present moment. Doing deep three-part breathing. Especially if the hindrances are strong.
If the mind is still drowsy, recite some Dhamma, recite the five aggregates. This is material form, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness. The hindrances are not too strong. If we're feeling some joy or rapture feelings, don't get lost in them. And open up to the flow of impermanence. Notice how quickly certain sensations arise, last a second, vanish, or last a few moments and vanish. Or if you hear any sounds in your home, the sounds arise and vanish, but perceptions arise in the mind. Or thoughts. Just observe the chess play.
If the mind has good awareness of the flow of impermanence, And just try to feel or imagine this body being an empty house with nobody at home to answer the call, knocking on the doors and windows. There's just the sensitive microphone in the house that knows. It cannot do anything. Painful sensations come and go, sounds come and go, even thoughts come and go. There's nobody to grasp. No, nobody to hold on. Let's check mating Mara. Now what perception arises in the mind based on that material vibration or thought. Sabi Sankara Anichati Yada Panyaya Pasati Atene Bindati Dukhi Yesa Maggo Visu Dukkha patta ca nidukkha Bhaya patta ca nibhaya Sokha patta ca nisokha Hantu sabbhi pipa All conditioned things, the five aggregates of this body, mind, and world are impermanent. They arise only to pass away and vanish. 
When one sees this with the eye of wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. This is the path to purity, to freedom. May the suffering be free from suffering. May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. In this way, may all beings live with mindfulness and wisdom. Thus spoke the Buddha. Okay, now, friends, let's finish this meditation by sending out thoughts of metta, friendliness, best wishes, ourself and all living beings. And again, we'll combine that with deep, slow breathing. So begin to take some three-part breaths if you can again. And hold the air in the lungs for as long as you comfortably can, you feel or imagine that oxygenated, that oxygen being like metta going to your blood cells, cells, blood taking it out to all the cells of the body, giving metta to your body and mind. And on the out breath, feel that relaxing contraction of the out breath and the mind settling to the present moment. Just take a few three-part breaths like that. Just imagine holding in the breath, being like strengthening and giving you the power of the spiritual faculties, the factors of enlightenment, charging up the body and mind with tranquility, energy, wisdom. And now, friends, uh, for those who might not know, our, our friend Prashant, who co-hosts these sessions, his mother just passed away yesterday. So let's send several breaths of metta to the mind or spirit of his dear mother, who is, you know, being transitioning to the next world. May these meta vibrations in our consciousness help to keep it from having any negative thoughts to guide it toward the light, the favorable conditions where she can regain the Dhamma, continue her path of spiritual evolution. We're just taking in a deep breath, holding in the breath and on the out breath, just imagine these vibrations of pure wisdom, love, energy, going to that departed being. And also sending some to Prashant to soothe this grief or feelings about loss.
and just continuing to send those vibrations out to all the other departed minds, all other beings throughout the whole world that are dying when they're still living and suffering in their minds. Just with the idea that may all living beings be well, peaceful and wise. May all living beings have the patience, strength, mindfulness and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. May all beings be able to hear the Dhamma, to cultivate the spiritual faculties, the factors of enlightenment, to guide their mind, to be able to checkmate Mara, to gradually overcome suffering. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. It's like a mantra reverberating throughout space. Well, peaceful and Okay, now to finish, I invite you to join in chanting the, the word sadhu three times. You're going to try to do that with the breathing. It's really beautiful. And a long out breath, feeling that vibration of sadhu in the nervous system. So breathe in. Sadhu Place your hands at the edges and knees. One more in breath, stretch the head back, pull the hands against the knees, to arch the lower spine. And lift the head up and on an out breath, press the chin to the top of the chest to stretch the neck vertebrae. And lift the head up level on an in-breath. And on the out-breath, put a smile on your face. 